Greetings, friends. My name is Pastor Myron, and I'd like to welcome you to our Saturday night service. Of course, tonight we're going to have the fellowship uh, uh, afterwards, the homecoming, and I suspect people will keep drifting in, and that's wonderful. Uh, we're going to skip the announcements tonight because we're going to have plenty of those uh, during the fellowship, so while you are eating, we'll have the announcements then if that's okay, because we're going to go ahead and skip the music and the sermon tonight so we can go ahead and get to the food, okay? <laughs> Not really. Not really. I was just testing. I was just testing to see if y'all were listening. We are not skipping anything. But we will skip the announcements. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this occasion in which we can come together and worship you and then have fellowship later. Lord, this has been such a long dry spell. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be in us and among us at this time, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds to the message that you have for us. And Lord, hear our praises as we sing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, if you are able, if you will stand and join me as we state our beliefs as found in the Apostles' Creed. The words will be on the screen. Let us state our beliefs. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. Our first scripture reading tonight comes from 1 Samuel, beginning at chapter 8, verses 4 through 20. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel is appro appropriately named after Samuel, the person God used to establish kingship in Israel, and the one who anointed the first two kings, Saul and David. Samuel's importance as God's representative during the, this period of Israel's history is close to that of Moses, since he, more than any other person, provided for the covenant continuity in the transition from the rule of the judges to that of the monarchy. At the beginning of 1 Samuel, the nation of Israel is at a religious low point. Even the priesthood was corrupt. During this time, the Israelites became dissatisfied with the abusive rule of judges, of the judges. The people longed for the glory of a monarchy such as they saw in surrounding nations. First Samuel recounts King Saul's extraordinary rise to power and influence and his subsequent tragic fall. Reading, uh, we're picking up at um, chapter eight, verse four. Israel asked for a king. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, they said to him, you're old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, Listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they're doing, so they're doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. 
He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve, make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer in that day. But the, peop the, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then he will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us, and to go out before us and fight our battles. Here ends the first reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ready to sing? All right, clap your hands just like this on the snare beat. There it is. Put your hands together. Sing it, come on.
may be seated. Thank you. Our second scripture reading tonight comes from 2 Corinthians, starting chapter 4, verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 1. Available evidence indicate that 1 Corinthians was written in the spring of 55 AD, and that 2 Corinthians was written later that year, before the onset of winter. The Corinthian church had been infiltrated by false teachers who were challenging both Paul's personal integrity and his authority as an apostle. Paul's main purpose for writing 2 Corinthians was to defend his ministry as his opponents in Corinth had severely attacked him. He wrote this letter to prove that his ministry was sincere and genuine and to reassert his authority as apostle of Christ. Second Corinthians was primarily a personal letter as Paul defends his ministry among the Corinthians and appeals to the factions in the church to reconcile themselves to each other. He speaks of the foundational doctrines of the Christian faith, the Trinity, as well as a deity, humanity, death, and the resurrection of Christ. He reaffirms that all believe, the believers have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so now we pick up in chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. Present weakness and resurrection life. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with him, with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may, may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And now reading from chapter 5, verse 1, awaiting the new body. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Here ends the second reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. We can and sing Waymaker, powerful song at this time. Keep light in the darkness, my God, 
that is who you are. Oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here. You're turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here. You're mending every heart. I worship you. Yeah. I worship. Lift your voice, say, Waymaker. Oh, yeah. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. are. Let's go to that bridge, sing this in. Even when I don't see it. You're working, even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Yeah, you never stop. Never stop, sing it again. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, never stop. Waymaker. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is, oh yeah, hey. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, oh one more time we say. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Amen. Greetings, friends. On the table on the clipboards, we have envelopes uh, for the offering. If this is just a regular offering, there's a box on there to check for that. Uh, Last week, we took up a special uh, gift for the No Church Left Behind. And if you were unable to leave your gift for that last week and you brought it this week, just write on the envelope what that's for. And there's plates by the doors, and you could drop that in on your way out. Let's, uh, Let's go to the Lord and give thanks. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the ways in which you bless us each and every day. And Lord, you bless us far more richly than we deserve. And Lord, we thank you for that. And at this time, we offer you back a small part of what you first gave us because, Lord, that's all you ask for is a small part. So accept our tithes and offerings, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you bless these gifts and bless the givers and multiply both here at Grace Wesleyan Church. And Lord, may the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, can y'all believe this? We're going to have like a fellowship dinner? Is this awesome or what? 
it, it, is, it is so good to be in a place where we can go back to church with some sense of normalcy. It's been such a, a dry year in that regard. The, we've had worship and we've had prayers and we've, we've had studies, but it hasn't been the same richness of fellowship that many of us have yearned for. And so here we are this week, the first week after Trinity Sunday. And y'all remember last week that, that Trinity Sunday, we celebrated a doctrinal holiday, not a, uh, it's the one high holy day that's not based on an event. It's based on a doctrine. And it's a dividing time in our year. And you remember before that in the year, we uh, uh, talked about all the things Jesus said and did. But now we're going to be focusing on what Jesus said and what Scripture tells us about being disciples going forward. So now we're back in the book of Mark for the, no relation to Mark Burton, but we're back in the book of Mark. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. But in the book of Mark, if you'll recall, we said this earlier in the year, Mark talks and focuses on what Jesus did, where Matthew and Luke focuses on what Jesus said, okay? So we're going to be looking at Mark and what he's talking about, what Jesus did, and we're going to be tying that into how that me what that means to us as disciples this year. How does that work out for us being disciples? And so I want to talk about, as we're disciples and we're working towards disciples, we might as well get a few house cleaning things out of the way right up front and the first thing is there's a cost there's a cost for following Jesus and that cost comes in a variety of ways the most significant way for most of us is to, it's a cost of friendship sometimes it's a cost of estrangement with family members because we may have parents or siblings or even children that don't believe like we do and we can feel a sense of loss because of that, because our kids, we brought them to church as they were growing up. And then when they become adults, they don't come to church. They don't want to come to church. Ah, Dad, I don't believe all that stuff. It's okay. I, didn't, I don't care that you made me go all those years, but I just don't go now. I don't know about y'all, but to hear those words just breaks your heart. But there's a cost. And Jesus is going to talk about that tonight. And, and the, the topic of the sermon tonight is a new family. I want you to look around because this is our family in Christ right here. We're going to break bread together, okay? This is a big, big family meal. That's what this is. But as we're paying this cost, because we live in a world that's self-centered, and some of that rubs off on us, we can't help it to some extent. I just want to share with you what's in it for us in a way that's graphic that will give you a visual. Because we all know about the, we've heard the talk about eternal life and, you know, uh, uh, we accept Christ. And, you know, if we're lucky enough now, we can start living into our eternity and, and the Holy Spirit's working on us, right? And through our sanctification and we, we become sanctified as a body. That means set aside for God. But what's in it for us? And, and I don't know how you visualize eternity okay or how you put eternity into scale based on your experiences here on earth so i saw something the preacher did some years ago and i i can't claim the originality for this and i'm not going to try to but this was cool the red part here this signifies all of historical time from genesis 1 to now the red okay just this let this be a visual of all of time from creation to now. However many years you think that is, whether you follow the geologists and it's so many millions or you follow Scripture and you think it's six, 8,000 or whatever, just let this be a representation of that, okay? There's a little blue spot in here. Can you all see that? Okay, that's just the modern era. That's so from enlightenment to now. It's 250 years maybe, 300 tops. It, this should be smaller, but if I made it any smaller, you wouldn't be able to see it way back at the back, okay? But let's just let that be modern time. Now, eternity is what's going to come after that. And eternity is a very long time. It kind of goes on. It might have a knot or two in it. But it's going to go on and on 
and on and on and on. So I don't know how long you think eternity is going to last. But it's going to be a very long time compared to the concept we have of time now. So no matter how far back you think the beginning of time was in terms of a time reference, eternity is way more than that. I mean, th there's not enough rope to do it justice. This was just all they had on the roll. So I just got it all. Okay, but that gives you all an idea. And so I'll be leaving this out for us to have a visual on this every week. We come to church, it'll be sitting somewhere when you see it. Remember that the cost we're paying as disciples, this is why we're doing it. Because we're going to spend eternity with God and Christ and our like-minded sisters and brothers, family members, those that went on before us, maybe even those that went on before us that we never knew, but we will meet. And maybe those that will come after us that we won't meet in this life, but we'll meet then. Because it's a very long time. So let's go to the scripture tonight and let's read what Mark has to tell us uh, about what's going on here in terms of uh, uh, relations. But uh, just to recap, we're going to pick up in Mark 3. So uh, Mark is the book of action. Okay, and in chapter 3, he has already covered the part of John the Baptist. And Jesus has gone into his ministry, and he's already started talking about things. And the, the, one of the first things he, he discussed was his, what he has power over. He's got power over demons, infirmities, illnesses, demons again. The publicans, which is the, the, the bureaucrats and stuff of the day. And then he goes in and he names his disciples. All 12, he chooses them. In, in Mark, it's very quick. He just lists off of who he called. There's no call stories per se. It's just straight to this is who I called. And that's at the beginning of chapter 3. So we're going to pick up chapter 3 uh, in verse 20, 20. And let's just hear what uh, Jesus says right after he's, the, Mark has told us who the 12 are. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he his, and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him because they had said, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He, Jesus, has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus asked. Then he looked around at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God indeed. So Jesus is telling us that a house divided can't stand. Now, many of us know that because of our current context. Within the house of our faith, there's been divisions. And there are many churches in our country right now that are facing catastrophic demise because of what's going on within their either local building or the denomination. We have chosen to step outside that fray and continue to be faithful and worship God as we understand. Okay? So for that, we have honored what Christ said here, and we're not trying to live in a house divided against itself. Y'all follow? Okay? So 
we are trying to, to do what God's asking us to do. And every time something comes up in Scripture for us, I want to point out that affirmation because we're going to get plenty against us. The, the headwinds coming at us, even if it's just headwinds, people are blowing at us, okay? So we need to make sure that we're hearing what Scripture tells us that reinforces what we did, what we are doing, and what we will do. So now Jesus is talking here. He, he went into a house to have a meal. So many people had gathered, they couldn't even eat. And his family had heard the stories of Jesus is casting out demons, and the religious authorities are after him, and they're going, uh-oh, we better go save that guy. Y'all don't think that's funny? Family's going to go save Jesus? Okay. Anyway, so they go down there to where Jesus is at, and somebody comes in and says, your mother and your brothers are outside. And Jesus says, my, mothers and brothers, my mother and brothers are in here. And I like the way he punctuates that. He says, whoever does my father's will are my sisters and brothers and mother. That's kind of a recurring theme here lately, isn't it? Jesus is telling us to obey. He's saying, if you love me, you will obey my father. You will obey me. You will do what scripture says. You will follow the laws you will do. See, these recurring themes are coming up because they are important. And this last week, uh, um, I found a, a video online where uh, uh, a pastor was saying that he respected those who thought they ought to do what, what we've done. He just fundamentally disagreed with what we're doing. And then he went on to point out inconsistencies in Scripture. Remember last week when I said something about John Wesley had said that the people that are overly intellectual and they, they rationalize ways out of Scripture to keep from following it. I, all I could hear when I was listening to this video of this guy was echoes of what John Wesley said. The people that are intellectual and they're rationalizing ways around what Scripture is trying to tell them. Does anybody here ever have Scripture hurt? Poke you with a pin? Jab you in the heart? Make you squirm in your seat? does to me all the time. Folks, that's when we know it's working. That's when we know our relationship with the Spirit is working. That's when we know God is doing something to and with us. We celebrate that. We don't run from it. We don't try to intellectualize and rationalize a way out of it. We pay attention to it. Okay, God, what are you trying to tell me? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable for some of us when those things where we're getting jabbed, that truth that we hear in Scripture makes us take a look at some of our relationships. Especially the people we love. People we've known for decades. And we know that God's telling us, you can love them, but don't follow them. You have to let them go. If you're going to follow me, you have to let them go. And I submit, there's probably nothing harder that we'll have to do. See, coming to church and even hearing a convicting sermon is often far easier than having to look at someone you love and realize that that person has gone wayward. They're not honoring God. They're not following what Scripture says, even though we know they were raised up in it, like in the case of our children, as I mentioned earlier, we have to let them go. We have to let them go get them some life. Some years ago, when I went to my very first AA meeting, the guy that was up front giving his story and his testimony, at the end of it, he said, there's been a lot of talk of God in here tonight. Talking to a room full of drunks. I mean, there's like 150 people sitting in an old church where this meeting was taking place. He said, some of y'all are going to leave tonight. So I'm not going back if all they're going to do is talk about God in here. And he said, that's okay. I get that. He said, the talk of God in these meetings runs you out the door. That's okay. The bottle will run you back in. And that was true. But you know what? I've since, that was 30 years ago. I've since learned 
that if there's certain things that convict you or that you hear in church or from Scripture that, that make you want to run, that's okay. You can go out there and get you some life. Life will run you back in here. If you've ever had a minute of relationship with Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit, and you run from what Jesus is telling you or what Scripture is telling you because you just don't like it or you don't want to hear it, that's okay. Go get you some life. Go get you some of what the world's got to offer. I promise it'll run you back in here because you will know the security, the strength, the hope, the real safe haven for your heart, your mind is here. Your spirit will lead you back here because your spirit will know where it needs to be around those that honor the spirit and love the spirit and honor God and love God and follow the lordship of Jesus Christ. The way Jesus says to follow him. Not the way somebody thinks that they can deduce based on the inconsistencies of Scripture that this is the way it kind of sort of ought to be because our modern understanding is such and such. I just don't get all that, folks. It seems to me that sometimes things get overcomplicated as we think it through too much. Scripture is simple as what Scripture says. What Jesus wants us to do is as simple as what Jesus tells us to do. So when it comes to dealing with family matters or the loss of those relationships, I looked up a few places here to give us some comfort, if you will, as to what Jesus is really saying about this as it pertains to us. And the first one we find in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse uh, uh, 49, and this is, this is kind of harsh, but listen to it in the context of what Jesus is saying about what we're going to encounter as we try to be disciples and we run up against people that either aren't willing to be a disciple or they're running from it and trying to take us with them. Jesus says, this is all red letters, so Jesus said it. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's completed. So Jesus knows that he needs to light a fire into people, okay? But first, he's got to have his own baptism. We know what that is, right? It's right there. So now he says, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He says, right there, it's going to happen. In another place, in Matthew, in Matthew 5, picking up in verse 17, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is telling us, don't intellectualize your way around things. Don't say because it's in the Old Testament it doesn't matter. Don't say because Jesus came, the old law doesn't matter because that's not what Jesus says. And then lastly, in Luke again, this time in chapter 18, verse 28, this is where Peter says that Jesus just did this, the parable of the rich man and he told him, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And the guy walks away sad. And then well, how, uh, Jesus says it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get to heaven. So then Peter's going like, whoa. And he says, we have left all we had to follow you. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Now, 
In Scripture, there's a, there's a numbering system. There's a multiplication system. 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's how much fruit there's. When, when you bear fruit, that's how much gain there is in scriptural terms. It's mentioned a couple times in the wisdom literature. So we can expect that when we have to let a wayward friend or family member or coworker go because they just don't want to follow scripture they just they say i don't believe that or i don't believe god would say that i don't believe jesus would want me to do that whatever the case may be and we let them go and we feel that loss first of all jesus told it was going to happen second he just told us that we will gain more than what we lose now my frame of reference for that is this before I surrendered my life to Christ and before I started letting the Spirit earnestly work on me to straighten out the mess I had made of things, I had maybe a dozen friends. Most of them were drinking buddies. That's about a dozen people I would consider friends. And one day about 20 years ago, I looked up and I realized I had a couple hundred or more. And when I say these were friends, I mean, I could call them up, invite them over to my house, or I'd been to their house. There was that many. I had given up the 12, and God had brought a much bigger circle of people into my sphere. Friends, the body of Christ is more than just a group of people we go to church with. Remember I told you all about how the body of Christ hugged me up when I had my cancer. The body of Christ is sitting all around us right now, and it's growing by the day. Contrary to what you might hear out there about, oh, religion's a passe. Christianity's going away. That's a good thing. Whatever you may see out there in the media or in socialist media or online or whatever, that's not true. The kingdom of God is growing. Maybe less in some places than in others, but it is still growing. It's growing in us. It's growing all around us. And tonight when we fellowship, our spirits, our spirits are going to know that we're engaged in a body of believers here, folks. Yeah, we're going to have some food have a lot of laughter we're going to learn a few things about what's coming up in the life of this church but be beyond the temporal things that we're going to pick up tonight we're going to get some spiritual things too that we may or may not realize tonight here in the moment or maybe you will but in the coming days in weeks as the life of our church continues to grow and evolve you're going to live into it you're going to experience it in real ways. And when the going gets tough, and it will, again, hopefully not as bad as COVID, but the going, the what? My battery's going low. But the going will get tough. But when it does, we got a family here to lean on. Our whole family here to lean on. And my hope and prayer is that every one of us are amenable and available and willing to be a shoulder, a set of hands, some feet, and a heart, whatever we need to be for each other in addition to what we do for the world. They say charity begins at home. This is home, folks. Let our charity, our love begin here with each other. And then let us carry it out where we have to go. Because this is our new family, right here, our new family. Let us live into that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That night that Jesus was betrayed, when he had a meal in the upper room with the disciples, he established a sacrament that we know as the Lord's Supper. As Methodists, 
we believe in an open table. And that open table means anyone is welcome. It doesn't matter if you're a Methodist or any other faith denomination. It doesn't matter if you've never even been baptized, folks. Because our the, the progenitor of our faith, John Wesley, he believed Jesus did this for everybody. And so do we. So uh, uh, regardless of your faith background, we want you to share the Lord's Supper with us tonight. So at that meal, at the beginning of the meal, Jesus took the bread. He lifted it to God and gave thanks for it. Then he blessed it. Then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he says, this is my body broken for you. Each time you partake of it, do this in remembrance of me. At the end of the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He lifted it to God and gave thanks for it. Then he blessed it. And he offered it to his disciples and he says, this wine represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. So, God, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you make for us this bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, so that we might be the body and blood of Christ to the world. So, friends, partake of your wafer, the body of Christ broken for you. Then likewise, the juice, the blood of Christ shed for you. This week, we've got much to pray for and to be thankful for. We also have some prayer concerns. Sharon, yeah, Sharon, Merritt. Sharon's sister had to have emergency bypass surgery yesterday, is that or Thursday? Thursday of this week. It was sudden. Um, likewise, I learned today that a close friend of mine, his wife was diagnosed with cancer, and in three weeks, she passed. Very sudden. And I've got a cousin in Indiana that was diagnosed a couple months ago with a single tumor, and uh, Tuesday of this week, an, uh, another scan, they stopped counting at 30 in his brain. And so uh, Jay probably doesn't have long to be with us, but uh, um, there's a lot of people that are experiencing different things like that. And Sandy's here uh, today. Her son Jason is recovering. Jason Bourne, we've been praying for him. And uh, he's recovering well. He's doing better. He's a, a younger man, so he's anxious to still get out there and get with it. So we want to pray for him to continue to have good recovery and healing, but to be patient and let his recovery uh, take place and, and to be sure. And um, I am sure that uh, many of us have prayers on our hearts. And I, if I've left one out, I'm, I don't mean to. But if you've got a prayer on your heart, know that God hears the prayers of your heart. And let's, let's pray together, and then we'll finish with the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we ask that you forgive us when we don't respond to you as disciples when you ask us to. Lord, forgive us those times when we just miss your ask. We miss your call. Lord, especially forgive us when we just say, I don't want to do that, God. Help us with our discipleship, Lord. Make us stronger. Forgive us when we let you down and show us how to love you better. Lord, we lift up to you all the doctors and nurses and uh, lab technicians and healthcare workers and the first responders, the, the firemen, the policemen, the EMTs, and all those who work so hard to keep us safe in our communities. Lord, we lift up all the frontline workers who have been working so hard this year to keep us in food and necessities. Lord, we lift up to you those who made the vaccines possible. And we thank you for the medical technology that allows us to be at a place now where we can have this evening. And Lord, we ask that you hear the prayers on our hearts that are the ones that we didn't speak personally, but you know Lord, that our, what our concerns are. Lord, help us with our worries and our fears and our anxieties. And Lord, as we learn how to be better disciples of Jesus Christ, hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he taught them to pray to your Father like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun of bed to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. Well, friends, we're going to break bread in just a minute, but first, it doesn't matter if you brought a dish or not, we want you to stay and have a meal with us, all of you, everybody here. But this week, when you're facing a tough spot, remember, you're not alone, even if you feel like you are in the moment. You know you've got the Holy Spirit and God and Jesus with you. We talked about that last week, but you've also got a family Right here, all of us. We're a phone call away. We're a short visit away. 
We're here for you. Me and everybody here. We're family. We're your new family. So let's pray for the food we're about to receive. Dear Lord, we thank you for this food. And we thank you for all the hands that prepared it and, and purchased it and brought it here. And Lord, we ask that you bless this food to nourish our bodies. And Lord, bless our bodies to your service. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So friends, we're not going in peace. We're going to eat.